It's half noon. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's actually my nap time, but <laughs> I figured I could forgo it for this. Okay. So first, I want to thank you for accepting my invitation and accepting accepting to talk with me. Thank you. I really appreciate you asking me. It's quite exciting. I thought to introduce you to my audience. Okay, my name is Retta Flag, and I am the author of Seven and an Eighth. Um, I'm self-published, and Seven and an Eighth is a story about the Pleiadian sisters, the Seven Sisters, um, in Greek mythology. The sisters were born of Atlas and Cle- Cle- Cleone. And at one point, Orion started chasing them around, and they got tired of it, and Zeus threw them up into the heavens, and they became the constellation of the Pleiades. So that's the Greek version of the story. You are from? Um, right now, I'm living in Virginia Beach, which is about three hours south of Washington, D.C., and before Sorry, I retired here three years ago, and with that, I lived in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for 40 years, and I grew up in the state of Maine, which is up in New England, where there's lots of snow and cold. Okay, okay. So, I saw you are a world traveler, too. Pardon? I saw that uh, you are a world traveler. Yes, I am. Um... One of the the biggest aspects of my life, and that's what I bring to this book, is that I've been involved with a group of, a spiritual group that has traveled around the world doing meditations at sacred sites all over the world. And through that, I've had a lot of mystical experiences and have studied deeply um spiritual principles and how to live your life in a spiritual manner. And uh, so I was bringing that as part of the matrix of the whole novel. Um, and and I know myself, I like to read, get my spirituality from a fiction story. And so that's how I structured the book, the novel, in that spiritual principles mixed so in with... Spirituality, yes. So you are you're more into spirituality. Yes. So you are more into spirituality. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, for most of my life, um, when I was growing up in Maine, I would talk to trees and lakes, and and uh, early on, well, I discovered existentialism in my late teens, early twenties, and then I discovered the goddess, which in Western culture that's not easy to do. I know and. In Hindu religion, there's tons of goddesses. It's very exciting. I love Hindu and India. Um, but in Western religion, it, they really say that goddess is back, you know. So then I just discovered the goddess. And then I don't know if you've ever heard of the Seth books by Jane Roberts. No. She was a trans channeler who wrote about the nature of reality. Okay. And it was the first time I ever heard of an explanation of reality that made sense to me. But she died before I could get to meet her. And then a trans channeler was coming to Pittsburgh and I'm like, oh great, I'm gonna to get to meet a trans channeler. And her name was Lee Schultz and she channels an entity named Samuel. Are you familiar with trans channeling? Yeah. Okay. And so I've worked with Samuel and a group of people that's grown up around his teachings for 35 years, you know, and we've, this is a group that's channeled, that's traveled all around the world. Um, If people are interested, they can go to discoversamuel.com to get more information on that. So how many countries you have traveled? Wow. Um, Asia, I've been to India, Cambodia, Vietnam, China, Japan. I've been to Australia, New Zealand, um, South America. I've been to Venezuela, 
Brazil, uh, Mexico, and I've been all over Europe and Egypt. Yeah, go on. So I've been to probably, I'd say a good 20, 25 countries around the world. So uh, what, is the, what is the difference that you observe with your eyes and ears? Uh, um, well, there's inner vision as well as outer vision. So a lot of mysticism is working with that inner vision and, and connecting to, I would say, the greater cosmic energy. Um, we like to put names on it. You know, we call it Jesus or God or Goddess. And it, and it's just, it's just so vast that we like to personalize it. And you really can't put a name on it. Um, I would call it Source instead of God or Goddess. And then the physical manifestation of that would be all that is, which is just exactly what it sounds like, everything that is. Okay. Yeah. So what is your book is about? Um, so Seven and an Eighth is about the story of the Pleiades. And when I talked to my spiritual teacher about it, he said, if you want to know what they did, look at the lives of their children. Um, I guess I'll tell this story. So I was a practicing witch and I had a full moon circle and we were doing a full moon ritual. And as we were doing the ritual, these energies came in and danced around the circle. It was, it was a lot of fun. And I named them, the, I thought it said it was the Pleiades sisters had come to visit us. So that really sparked my interest in them. And I started doing research and realized that much, much more than just being a small, obscure Greek myth. They were in every major society, ancient society. There's a story about them. It's the the Criticas in India and uh, the the Mai Mai and um, the Maori, and uh, they're in Japan and they're you know they just everywhere around the world. They have impacted ancient history. So. I realized I wanted to tell their story and get that information out to the world about how much more important they were. And they were female avatars, which, again, that's been pushed under the rug, particularly in Western culture, that you can have Jesus, but you can have female avatars as well, or, or Buddha, you know, like Buddha or um, Muhammad. But they, so that information is coming out now and I, I wanted to write about that as well what their work was in the world are you a full-time writer um well i'm retired now so writing is more my hot retirement hobby now this book took me 25 years to write and okay. i did it a bit here and a bit there and then once i retired i had started the editing process i had finished the rough draft and gone through the, the part of the editing process. But once I retired, we took a, it took a full year to get it up to snuff and out and publish, self-publishing. So I still have, I have a couple of the stories that I'm, book novels that I'm working on and, and it's, it's what I do as I re, in retirement. What was your job before retirement? I was a massage therapist for 30, 30 years and was very active in my pr profession. Um, it was a good career. I enjoyed it a lot. And before that, I worked as a journey person millwright, which I was the second female journey person millwright in Pennsylvania. Um, to align with the machinery. So when a motor turns a pump, that has to be aligned this way and this way within five thousandths of an inch. So a lot of our work was in big um, industrial places, steel mills and power plants and paper mills. And I usually was the only woman on a crew of 200 men. So it was um, 
one of the feminist things that I've done with my life experience. So, so you said uh, it took uh, 25 years to write your first book. Yes. So when is the second book is going to come? Oh, I don't know. I might be just as slow on this one. <laughs> I keep like, okay, let's do some more. Okay, all right, now we're done. <laughs> now I'll procrastinate for a while longer. <laughs> uh, so what is the second book, Jana? It's a science fiction story. And uh, it's about, um, well, I was going to have it a spaceship full of women, but I'm leaning towards the trans aliens now i'm not sure uh, actually the character in seven and an eight was genderless and was genderless for the full 25 years it took me to write it i thought that was important uh, so trans isn't new to me as a concept um and so it's gonna uh need a mechanic to repair the spaceship and it's going to be a spaceship that travels by the speed of thought so it will require spiritual principles in order to be a mechanic as well. Uh, that's the basic premise of the story. So the spiritual knowledge that you have, you're going to connect with uh, the, uh, the, the, this story, this story, science fiction yeah. story. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm sure that is going to be good. I think so. I think my book that I've written, it's well done. It's a good story. Um, it's funny, you know, so I, and I've really got to put in a lot of spiritual principles without being didactic or what I call it is um, spirituality without dogma. And I know in the U.S., I, um, I'm not sure how things are in, in India, but in the U.S., 30 percent of millennials, I believe, and um get their spirituality from something other than religion so it's a movement for people to experience and experience who they are as a spiritual being in the world without going through a religious community in that sense so i'm writing for that audience so you said uh, you traveled to india so yeah. uh... How much percentage that you found uh, 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 in India when it comes to spirituality out of 100? Oh, my goodness. I, I just loved India so much. I can't even begin to say how wonderful India is. And I would love to get back there. <laughs> you know, it, it was just such a beautiful country, and the people are so amazing. It's really amazing. Um, we actually went into Kolkata. So we didn't do the whole Taj Mahal kind of, of trip because we weren't there for being tourists. We were there for spiritual purposes. And we were connecting with energies in the rivers. So Kolkata was a place for us to connect into the Ganges, which, you know, it's a very spiritual river in India. And that was the easiest way for us to pick up that energy and do some work on there. And then we went to the Brahmaputra River and did work there. Um, we stopped at several temples and it got to experience the temple life and went to um, a big animal preserve and you know rode elephants out to see the rhinoceros and visited one of the tribes up in Assam and had they have Americans in for dinner, and we were the largest group they'd ever hosted, called the Missing Tribe. And they danced for us, and we danced for them. We were actually on national India TV with our dance for the Missing Tribe, because it was a, a big deal for them to have that many Americans come to their tribe. And uh, which it was a great, it was a great experience the whole all the way around. They they tried to get us very drunk with their rice wine <laughs> and uh, we were trying to resist <laughs> and they gave us food and they wanted us to eat their very very hot peppers which you know again most of us couldn't even get near them I think I waved my hand over one and it was too much for me <laughs> you know? 
But and it and it was just I just remember driving through the countryside and how much we loved it. Yeah. So what are the other countries that you love and that you have seen made you uh, made you uh, to visit again and again? Well, I really love them all. Uh, but um, India is one that I would go back to. Cambodia was a big surprise to me how much I loved it there. And, um, you know, Australia, we went out into the outback to the well, it's commonly called Ayers Rock, but the native people call it Uluru. And watch the sunrise on this gigantic orange rock in the morning because it was freezing cold. <laughs> and we're like, oh, there it is. It's so spiritual. <laughs> and we took um, a riverboat ride on the Nile. And watching the sunrise on the Nile, oh my goodness, it's one of my most favorite memories ever. And in Scotland, um, they have the standing stone and the stone circles. And I had been told that I had a past life near one of the standing stone circles. And we got there and we're meditating and like, this bright sunshine came out and there was a rainbow over the valley, you know, and it was, it was quite, quite the experience. So, so do you have anything to say to the world who watches this video from anywhere on this planet? Yeah, well, we're, we're in such an important time right now. And anybody that's been hearing the news about the U U.S. know it's pretty challenging at this point. But here's what I know as a spiritual being, is that we are in the midst of an evolutionary leap in humanity. And that leap is that we're going to remember that we're all love that we're all one and that oneness I and mean, if you just think about the implications of what it means if everyone believes that we are all one that takes away wars that takes away misusing um resources i mean it affects so many parts of our lives that that my message would be that there is so much hope and so much promise in humanity, even though there's so many people that don't want us to believe that and to, that want us to stay cowering in our fear and, and following their dictates, which are not in the best heart of humanity or the planet. But, um, and, and the heart of the book is about the meaning of love. What does love mean? Do you mind if I read a passage? No, you can you can do that. Okay. Let me just read this to you because this is the the center of what my book is about. So in the book, there's a person who's sort of like, you know, checking things out and trying to grow spiritually, and in their dreams they meet this mysterious hooded figure that starts taking him on these amazing journeys through time and space. And the um, hooded figure is called the hooded one, okay? I, and I have to laugh, people ask me what's the name of my main character, and I don't even know. I don't even know what the main, of uh, my main character who's on the spiritual journey is. I just have the name that the hooded one gave him or her as their name. So, um, it starts out with a, a scene where there's been a lot of trauma and they're in the dreamlike state. And so um, the character wakes up and they're in this, it's like a cozy room with a fireplace and a table and, and they always have a cup of tea, you know, for it. So um, I'm sitting with the hooded one in her co cozy room again. How many times have I become aware in my dreams of this scene unfolding? It feels like home, 
a home where I am safe, a place where I can always get a good cup of tea. And the hooded one says, if I had known that tea would lure you here, I would have tried it many years ago. We both laugh. It's a good laugh. My banter about tea is a way to avoid the misery in my heart. My banter about tea is a way to avoid the pain and suffering this world that's weighing me down. The hooded one reaches out and lifts up my chin to look me in the eyes. I only see the blank hood that surrounds her face, but I am comforted by the gesture. And the hooded one says, little one, suffering is one of the many means ego uses to keep you bound to flesh instead of bound to spirit. And the person replies, but there is so much pain in the world. And the hooded one replies, and so much love and beauty. Ego chooses to stay focused on the pain. It chooses to suffer because of the pain. That suffering keeps you vested in ego. Ego was designed as a tool to function and form. Spirit is the driving force, not ego. Yet ego is also designed to, every, to do everything it can to keep you safe while you are informed, even so far as to deny spirit when it feels threatened. One method it uses is to elevate suffering to a spiritual practice. The truth is you suffer because you are mad at God. It doesn't matter why. There are probably hundreds of times in your life when it seemed that God wasn't there or didn't seem to care. Ego capitalizes on that anger to reign supreme. Pain is a side effect of learning. Forgive God, forgive yourself, and move on. If love is so simple, why is it so hard? And she answers, simple does not always mean easy. Think of love and tell me what it means. And the person thinks, well, a glib answer dies on my tongue as I think of all my relationships and the many ways I experience love in this world. The love of my parents, siblings, friends and lovers, my love of life and nature and pets. Do I know the meaning of love? And the hooded one says, well, the power of love is simple, the expression of love in form is rich and diverse as it reflects the divine matrix you call God or goddess. And the person replies, that doesn't answer why it is so hard to love. And she replies, it's not that it's hard to love. It is how you've been taught to love that makes it hard. People mistake power or lust or fear for love. Parents teach their children what they learned was love, even if it means inflicting pain. It's not that parents want to hurt the children. Everyone does the best they can with what they have in the moment. If you don't have a clue to love, it's hard to teach it to someone else. So nice. It's the, the journey to learn what love means. Uh, nice. Which is what our many lifetimes are about. Wow. Yeah. So, at last, uh, uh, have you seen any videos of mine, previous videos on YouTube? Yeah. Yes, I watched a few. Um, I know this is good. I really like the one about the accidental mobster. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Quite the character. <laughs> <laughs> I had a good laugh with that one. <laughs> um, I watched the one with the woman who was the goddess worshiper in Germany who, and who like wrote novels about the goddess and connecting with the goddess. Yeah. And there was another one, uh, I think it was the author Dick Clark who wrote writing several novels about life experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, 
they're very interesting and entertaining and give a lot of information you wouldn't think about some of them yeah i'll put uh i'll put your book uh, in the storefront of mine in the description of this video oh, thank you thank yeah, you people. you want me to send you a link to the amazon or yeah Will amazon link yeah if you send me the amazon link i'll put uh, in my storefront people who finds uh, who watches this video they can uh, find the uh, book of yours yeah. well there is a whole chapter in this book on the seven sisters in india with kartikeya and the criticals are you familiar with that okay i, I mean it talks about Ganga coming to the earth and being in Shiva's head and he pours her out on the earth. I mean, it's such an incredible visual scene, you know, that and so mystical to have that happen. I mean, the Hindu mythology is so rich and so deep that it, I mean, you can write a whole book just about one thing and, and still not cover it all. But yeah, so I do have that in the novel for the Indian readers as well. Yeah. Yeah, the I'll 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 share this so that people can find it. Great. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, thank you for giving me your valuable time and uh, explaining uh, explaining me about spirituality and uh, about your world uh, travel experience and uh, about uh, your book. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I love to talk about travel and I love to talk about my book. So. This works out perfectly for me. <laughs> thank you. Keep going. Keep doing what you love and uh, keep smiling. Your smile is fantastic. Oh, thank you so much. All right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can All I right. put this video on uh, YouTube and uh, on social media and on internet with your permission? I look forward to it. Thank you. Absolutely. You can. Thank you. Thank you so much again. All right. Take care. Bye.